God's word is amazing. It's, we were talking the other day about how it's the mirror for you to see yourself as that powerful spirit being and to start there. Today I want to talk about getting your heart to work for you. Getting your heart to work for you. As I look around the planet and I recognize the distrust that has developed as never before in all of us average everyday people and do we trust the words of our leaders? Politics, news, healthcare, take a pick. But everywhere I go and every people I, person I talk to, there's this massive distrust And the fault is ours as a church because the Bible says we are to be the salt and the light on this planet, that we are to be the head and not the tail, that when it comes to rising up, we are to be the influencers. It is taught story after story through the Old Testament, and it's taught again and again through the Word of God. We as a church need to recognize that we have to equip every generation for the work of the ministry. The work of the ministry is not just pastoring. Every one of us are ministers of the gospel. And so if we're in business, rise to the top and be the head, not the tail. If you're involved in the arts, television, movies, politics, education, health care, business, leadership, every area as a believer you are all called to be influencers there. You are called to succeed, to be significant, to move out of survival mode to stability, from stability to success, from success to significance. This is upon every believer. Every believer is to be the head and not the tail in the areas that you have moved into. However, I've noticed as I travel and as I work with even the people that begin to come to Springs Church, I notice that the doctrines that have been taught for decades, for a hundred years or more, have almost destroyed the church's ability to be salt and to be light to this world. There's two of them specifically that really get me upset because I just see them everywhere in churches and denominations. The first one is that we are sheep to the slaughter. Well, the Bible says, Pastor, we're just sheep to the slaughter. So, you know, on this world, we're not going to succeed. One day in the sweet by and by, I'll, I'll get my mansion. Right now, it's just a cabin. One day, I'll be happy, and, but right now, it's just barely get through. Where in the world did you get that from? The Bible does not say that you are sheep to the slaughter. Read it. It's a comparison. It says that when the world looks at us, we are as sheep to the slaughter. We won't cheat like they do. We won't cheat, backstab like so many people. We won't lie. We won't do things. We won't tell half-truths to get ahead. We rely not just on our skill and ability, but the grace of God, the blessing of God, this incredible presence of God that takes us. And the Bible says promotion comes from the Lord. And so when they look at us, and go, well, man, you need, to, you need to be like everybody else. You need to cheat, steal, lie. I don't mean everybody, but I mean, you, there's a ton of people we know that whatever business or world that you're in, that to get ahead, they are doing things, a lot of them that you don't want to do. And so you look like sheep to the slaughter. You are not doing what needs to be done to get ahead. And I, we refuse because character and honor and integrity and representing Christ is crucial to us or we're not going to be salt and light. You are not sheep to the slaughter. You are not this nothing thing that's just kind of getting through life at the bottom end of the spectrum. That is a wrong doctrine. But it has literally caused much of the church of Jesus Christ to be so passive because they think we're sheep. 
No, I'm like Jesus, by the way, and Jesus is not the sheep of Judah. He's not the goat of Judah. He's not the poodle of Judah. Jesus is the lion of Judah, and it shows a, there's different looks at the Christian. We're not sheep walking around going, don't hit me, don't hit me, and whatever you say, we're just sheep to the slaughter. We're just a poo, 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 little Christian. We're just a church bed getting by. Not a chance. We are the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. The Bible says I can run through a troop, leap over a wall. God is with me. He's my rear guard. He's before me. He's my protection. The angels of God are encamped around about me. I'm more than an overcomer. Read your Bible. The second doctrine, the second doctrine that, that I see just everywhere, and it just ticks me off, is this, this, this end times belief that Jesus has to come and rescue his poor church because we're so defeated and we're just a remnant. Everybody's backsliding. Everybody's leaving. And there's just a remnant left. And before the remnant is gone, he has to come in and swoop us up and rescue us from the big bad devil and the world. Well, I didn't know Jesus was so wimpy. I didn't know that the gospel was so weak. I didn't know the cross wasn't a definitive battle that won. So we're just, you know, right now, Leon, we're just, you know, hey, what, what does this mean? Is this got to do with the fourth horse of the apocalypse? Is this got to do with the bowls that are being poured out? Where are we in Revelation? I don't care. Hello. I don't care. We got whole churches basing their entire growth on explaining the book of Revelation. Listen to me. I, I, I am in a lot of different denominations, and I got news for you. The Baptists theologians don't agree with the Pentecostal theologians, who don't agree with the Wesleyan theologians, who don't agree with the Lutheran theologians, who don't agree with the Presbyterian theologians, who don't agree with the Anglican theologians, and they all have Greek and Hebrew, and they've been studying it for decades and decades. Why in the world are we going to throw our hat in the ring and give our version? And there's got to be about 30 versions of the end times out there. Well, Leon, the Bible says that, you know, there's a blessing on, of course there is. But if you're going to the book to interpret modern events, you're missing something. You see, Jesus is not coming back for a defeated, whipped puppy dog little church who's barely getting by because the world is smarter, more powerful. The devil, the big bad devil, he's so amazing. And we're just poor little bleh, Christians, just sheep, just following Jesus. We're just passive and... This, this is a wrong teaching. I remember when I was a teenager, I watched this movie that was just going through the churches called Left Behind. Now, their purpose was to scare the hell out of anybody they could and then get you to give your life to Christ. And so, I mean, I got rededicated every time I saw it. I was getting saved all over again because I didn't want to get left behind and get beheaded in jail and all this stuff. Listen, the most biblical way you can be when it comes to when Jesus is coming back and we enter those phases is he said, occupy till I come. The word occupy, it means to do business, buying, selling, succeeding, rising up in whatever area that you're in. Occupy this planet, not like be the slave barely getting by on this planet. Every promise in the word doesn't stop working because all of a sudden someone says, we're in the end times. Or someone says, oh, we are now in the season of this. This is the promises of God still work for protection. The promises of God still work for healing. The promises of God still work for success and blessing and rising up. So these two doctrines seem to, and one group of churches, they just this passive sheep mentality. And in the other group, it's like, oh, all this intellectual, deep, prophetic look at Revelation. And they don't even bother winning souls to Christ. Well, they all meet in their groups talking about the end times and figuring out in the Greek and the Hebrew and the time stamps and all this. Listen, I've studied that as much as most people. And I'm telling you that I, God is still God and the word still works. And if time is short, then I'm going to ramp up what we're doing, which is winning more souls, getting in more languages, planting more churches, raising up more leaders. And herein lies the rub that I want to talk to you about today. If we don't like the leaders we have in our, in any area of our communities, then it's our fault as a church. 
Because we as leaders, we as parents, are to be equipping the saints for the work of the ministry, is what it says in Ephesians 4. That doesn't mean you're all called to be preaching from behind a lectern. It means that if you're in politics, that he wants you to influence, he wants you to succeed, he wants you to rise up and be the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. But until you get rid of this whipped puppy, we're just sheep, barely getting by as though people who don't know Jesus are smarter, bigger, better. Read the Old Testament. The greatest leaders that the world had ever seen were the ones who worked for God. Moses leading an entire country through the desert and any other country that messed with him was taken out. He met with God. Solomon, one of the most brilliant leaders, politicians, strat that ever lived. Take a look at how God is showing us that we are called, all of us, to influence. And today, every born-again believer is filled with the presence of God. Now, take a look at leaders today. When a leader does not know who they are in Christ, they can still be beautiful, wonderful people, okay? But without God's grace in our spirit, without God's grace flowing and his wisdom in, on the inside of us, even if they have the acumen, even if they have the ability, very, 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 very few people can maintain a high level of leadership where the further you get up, the greater the stress, the more people attack you, the more the public comes against you, the more they're gonna lie, cheat, and steal, backstab, and the people are, et cetera, et cetera. And so they literally begin to have uh, emotional issues. They have physical health issues. I know because many of them call me. They begin to have relationship issues as marriages can't handle the intense amount of time. Families and kids can't handle the stress and the pressure that even if the man or the woman can handle it, they, it literally is transferred into other areas of their lives because... When you know Christ and his presence is on the inside of your spirit, you now have an ability to maintain high levels of leadership with massive amounts of stress because you are in his rest, his ability, his peace, his wisdom, his presence is it sustains you. Now, to be, to be physically minded, that's death. In other words, you can be a wonderful person, but if you depend upon just your five senses, your acumen, your giftedness, your skill set, you're finished. But if you can be spiritually minded and you can literally begin to, we talked about where you can become spiritually minded is to look at the mirror of the Bible and this is who I am. This is how I've been designed. This is who God is. This is the truth. The Bible is the mirror to the spirit realm and you as a spirit. It's crucial that we raise up our kids and train our kids, our teens, and everybody now, wherever you are in life, that you are called to influence there. The grace of God, the blessing of God, the power of God, the wisdom of God, the, the joy of the Lord, all of these beautiful things, the world should be attracted to you. The Bible says it's the goodness of God that leads a man to repentance. He wants you to succeed. Yes, because he loves you, but he's got another reason. He wants people to look at you and go, I want what you want. Uh, God, I, I need to know how you do this. How do you do this and hang on to your marriage? How do you do this and get through a storm with a smile on your face and a knowing when the dust settles, I'll still be standing. There's something about the believer that we need to take our place on this planet, not as one comparison to sheep, but as an overcomer, born of God, who we are in Christ, as he is, so are we in this world. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 14, it says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are no longer under the law, but you are under grace. Now, the second we hear the word sin, we automatically think, oh, so he's talking about wrong sex, drugs, uh, and murder. Yes, that's included in sin, but it's what most people don't realize is included in the word that you know they don't understand. The word sin in most of its uses literally means to miss the mark for God's best for your life. Let me give you a sin that most people don't realize. Did you know that to have a heart of unbelief, he calls it evil. 
when the children of Israel wouldn't go into the promised land after watching miracle after miracle by God getting them out of Egypt and then miracle after miracle in the desert and they still didn't believe he could take them in, it says they limited God. And here's what the Bible calls them. It says they had an evil heart of unbelief. Did you know that to have unbelief and to not believe God is sin? It's something that disturbs God when he says he's a man after my own heart. It wasn't because he was looking at a person who was going to be completely sin-free and walk around, you know, or sit in the lotus position and meditate. When he mentioned it about David, he was talking about a guy who would never let his beliefs move away from God is the only hope, the only way. Therefore, the Bible says that that we are not under the law, but we are under grace, which is God's ability inside of us. And it works by faith. It's by grace are you saved through faith. Therefore, the issue of grace in your life is what determines whether your life as a believer will be one of joy, peace, rest, and victory. Or you're going to have this difficulty of frustration and defeat, uncontrolled emotions in every area of your life. Those areas, this is not up to God. This is up to you understanding his grace and understanding how faith and grace work. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 9, it says, Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that your heart be established with grace, not with meats. It's talking about this external, always looking at the outside. It says if your heart is not established in grace, it doesn't matter how perfect your outside behavior is. You could literally walk around in almost perfect perfection with you don't do anything bad, look at anything bad, say anything bad, uh, etc. Yet because your heart's not established in grace, it doesn't do a bit of good for you. Your heart must be established in grace. You see, our spirit man can only be changed by God, but our hearts have to be changed by us in agreement with God. God can't change your heart. You have to work with him. And as you work with Holy Spirit, you can change this heart from one of stress and worry and fear and, and, and all this to one of grace, where your heart is established that Jesus paid the price. He made me righteous. All of God's on the inside of me. As he is, so am I in this world. And something changes in you. And listen, the rest of your life's not going to get any better. You can say, well, my ship's not in yet. It ain't ever coming in because it's not up to God. It's up to you to change your heart. Well, you know, I'm just waiting, praying, hoping, and believing. Well, I don't know if you are, but if you're not dealing with heart beliefs, then you are a ground, groundhog day Christian. You're going to just have more of what you've always had. So my challenge to you today is that you need to deal with your heart. You, and I don't mean because you are such a bad person. I mean the heart is the autopilot for your life. Where you have been going in a general way is showing us the beliefs that are entrenched in us by our parents or religion, etc. See, your heart is the place where who you are in your spirit and who you are in your own thinking, your soul, where they come together. And this causes conflict for many Christians. They're going to give in to one way or the other. Which way are you going to side with? And so many people not understanding how to begin to establish their heart in grace. And grace is God's ability. Grace is his peace, his joy, his favor which comes to you for free. When you got saved, God gave you a new heart. But if you don't quickly get into the word of God, all of your wrong thinking, believing, and habits will destroy what he's done there. And you will move back into the way you believed 
before. In Hebrews chapter 4, the whole chapter, it talks about a rest for the children of God. And this rest is where you succeed without wrecking your body, without blowing your mind, without extreme emotion wrecking you. It, it, it works without destroying your marriage and, and, and wrecking your kids and, and, and your reputation. The rest of God is, is literally meaning you've come to a place where you understand how to get God's grace in your heart, how to convince your heart with the word. A part of it is renewing your mind, looking at the mirror of God's word and the autopilot which controls your future. The control for your future is not in heaven. The control for your future is not sitting in the church. The control for your future is a thing called your heart. It is not your spirit although it seems like it. It's not your soul, although it seems like it. It's this kind of connection of where soul and spirit meet. When you look at the Bible and what it has to say about the heart, it's, it just blows your mind as to how many scriptures are talking about your heart. It says, let not your heart be troubled. A troubled heart can't believe. Guard your heart with all diligence because guard it, that's your autopilot. Keep the word in the center of your heart. That's your programming. As a man thinks in his heart, so he is. That's your identity. Establish your heart in grace. That's the power of changing anything. It's by grace that you're saved through faith. Don't doubt in your heart because doubting in your heart is, a, is an opposite belief. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart for the things ahead of you. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. If you sit there in emotion of not getting what you want and moaning and groaning, the longer the enemy can keep you in a negative emotion, the more he can influence your heart beliefs. No wonder it says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Every, I've heard a bunch of different theories on that. Well, let me show you what it's about. It's because if you stay in an emotion that is not found in heaven, then you weren't designed to have it. And if it's there, get rid of it quick because the enemy is able to conceive sin in your life when you stay in a negative emotion. You can feel like you have a right to be mad, envious, jealous, upset, ticked off, whatever words you want, depressed, down, gloomy. You go ahead and stay there. But the longer that you stay in a negative emotion, the more power the enemy has to influence the beliefs of your heart. They come in through your emotions, into your thinking, from your reasoning. And if they're left there through repetition and emotion, they drop into this thing called your heart. There are people with sick hearts today, simply meeting hope deferred makes the heart sick. You've got no more hope for this marriage, no more hope for your job, no more hope. You just give up your, you just throw up your hands. There's no more hope. The Bible says you're not to be like that. You're to look right back into the perfect law of liberty. Look at the mirror of the Bible and see who you are. You're not your five senses and your emotions. Those can go up and down. You can get so weary you stop. You look at who you are in the Bible because he heals the brokenhearted. People deceive their own heart with their talking. James chapter 1 says, I could do a message on every one of those lines I just read. I just want to show you something. You want change? It starts in the autopilot. And if you don't change the autopilot, then you have no hope. You can go ahead and pray to God all you want. You can fast, you can pray, you can intercede, you can do tongues, you can do all nine different kinds of prayer. But if your praying is not changing the your heart by renewing your mind and the Holy Spirit goes to work with you on your heart, nothing changes. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18, it says there, but we all, every one of us, with an open face are beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Did you know that Jesus did not do one miracle as God? Jesus did every miracle on this planet as a man full of grace. 
He was full of grace and truth, but he came as a man. That doesn't mean he was any less God. He just gave up the rights, the privileges, and the power of being a part of the Godhead, and he came as a man. And anytime you look at Jesus, people will go, well, that's Jesus. No, as he is, so are we in this world. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 9, it says, don't be carried around with different doctrines, strange doctrines, for you need to have your heart established with grace. I'm reading that a second time. I'm saying that this is an absolute key from the Old and the New Testaments that this is crucial. Now, there's a verse in the Bible, and let me just read this to you. It says here in John chapter one, verse 16. It says, for out of his fullness, his abundance, we have all received. All have had a share and we are supplied with one grace after another. Spiritual blessing after spiritual blessing. Favor upon favor. Gift heaped upon gift. He's talking here about this grace. It says, for while the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. We are to be like Jesus. That is why, yes, but did you know that you are, are not fully human. Am I an extraterrestrial pastor? (laughs) Yeah. Actually, it says I am crucified with Christ in Galatians 2.20. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I look at myself and I say, hey, I'm part human but I'm part Jesus. This incredible, amazing presence of God resides in you and I. It is a part of the mystery of the gospel that so many Christians don't push through. You must begin to look into the word of God. You must get your heart established in grace. And now someone says, well, Leon, where's the devil in all this? It's a good question. By the way, he's never stopped working on you. He's never stopped He's shot his best shot. Well, really? Yes. I have people that go to the mission field and they talk in third world countries about raving lunatics and they say, you know, that's demonic oppression and possession and whatever else and and we don't see much of this. Are you kidding me? The devil will attack anyone who is not emotionally secure. Let me cut through. I, I, I want to read a bunch of verses, but my time is almost up. The Bible says the devil in Peter is like a roaring lion walking around looking for someone to devour. What's he looking for? Well, when you watch lions, whether you watch YouTube or you see lions on the hunt, you'll notice that when they attack a herd, they will try to move out the weakest one, the youngest one, the sickly one, a pregnant one, anything that makes them not as fast and not as tough. They circle that one out and they all try to take him down. When the enemy, like a roaring lion, is walking around, it means he can't just take anything he wants. He's looking for something. What's he looking for? He's looking for a weakness in the area of heart beliefs. He's looking for a wrong heart belief because The battlefield is the mind, and then he can begin to heap on the accusations. He is the accuser of the brethren. He'll bring up your past and just mess with you on it. He'll give you reason after reason, and he likes to look for emotional people. You see, say, well, Leah, I just can't help it. I'm emotional. No, all of the good emotions God's given us is great. But you see, emotions come from thinking. Deep feelings come from heart beliefs. When you begin to, and we've taught on this before, and you can get a hold of those series, but a lot of people think, well, I just can't control my mind. Wrong. 
The Bible says in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5, it says there that we've got weapons that are mighty through God. And the, where, where these weapons are effective is in your reasonings, your arguments, your thinking. These are strongholds. And it says, take every thought captive. We absolutely can control our thinking. We absolutely can influence our emotions to such a degree that we are not living in fear fear and every other emotion that comes out of fear. We've swallowed the thinking of the world that it's just a sickness. It's just an, a, a condition. And, and so we just give up. The Bible has answers. And I'm meeting so many believers who emotionally, they are wondering why they can't control their emotions. You can, you just don't believe you can. And the way you do that is by looking into the mirror of God's Bible, of the Word of God, and allowing these truths to begin to renew your mind, drop into your, and it does not take long. And this heart begins to produce new autopilot directions in relationships, new directions in finances, new directions in health, new directions in joy and happiness because the heart is the autopilot of your life. Ignore it to your own peril because your heart has beliefs. It was programmed by your upbringing, your parents, television, things that happened to you, teachers, uncles, aunts. You've already been programmed. If you don't like it, change it. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4, it says, whereby are given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature and escape the corruption that is in this world. Listen to me, the divine nature is in your spirit. Now someone's going, yeah, it doesn't do me much good. You're right, although it does, it gets you to heaven. But you want to be a partaker taker of the nature of God. His nature is joy, peace, healing, health. I mean, bigness, power, etc. That's God. That's his nature. And that nature is in you. How do you partake of it with your physical body? How do you partake of it with your emotions? How do you partake of it with your thinking? You use the promises. What are the promises? They're God's word. If you, didn't, you can't just ignore the word of God. And then pray for power. You can't just never meditate in the word of God and then scream for help. You need to deal with this autopilot. So recognize that this autopilot of the heart, that you need to go to the word. And there are promises, by the way, that are more important than some of the ones you've been focused on. Like the promise of being righteous as a gift. Oh, you're, you're trying to claim the promises of healing, prosperity. Great, you can do that. But have you even claimed the promise until you believe that you're righteous because Jesus makes you? Have you taken that promise that says you're a new creation, old things have passed away, and everything is new? Or are you still sitting under the accusations and the guilt and the condemnation of past things that you've done? Are you taking the promises of God that says you, you're more than an overcomer and then stop seeing yourself as stupid and weak and a weakling and not as smart as everybody else. We're not dealing with the most basic issues. Now we're trying to believe God for a healing or prosperity or whatever and we haven't even dealt with the, with the powerful basics of what to believe. My challenge to you today, my time is up, is I'm bringing you such hope. Your life is just a week away from getting in there and beginning to work on your autopilot called your heart and never stop. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter four, verses 20 and on, it says, keep your eyes and your ears focused on the word of God because that is where your mind stays renewed. Your heart stays established is in the speaking and the meditation and the listening and the thinking through of God's word as you choose him and you begin to believe on him. The life that you live should completely change. And if it's not, God is not holding back. If it's not, God has not said no. If it's not, 
It's not God's issue. It's not God's move. He's given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. There's a percentage of people, nobody here, nobody here, but there's a percentage of people too lazy, too, you know, just, I don't know what it is, to get in the word and recognize the incredible power of developing new heart beliefs, renewing your mind, falling in love with Jesus because of what he's done and the incredible changes that will touch you right now. Did you know that your life is to change continually until you die? And I don't mean get worse and worse. I don't mean my 20s were the good old days. I don't mean my 30s were the good old days. You ask me what my favorite time was, it would be yesterday, and I'm looking forward to tomorrow. It doesn't matter what age I am, because I'm looking forward as the best is yet to come. You need to be looking forward to that. God's going to change you, remake you, mold you in the heart area, but only as you. God can't change your heart. Every verse I gave you says you. Now, Holy Spirit will work with you. This is phenomenal, incredible, amazing news. This week, start tonight, make a decision. I'm going to begin to establish myself in the basics of Christianity, that it's not self-righteousness, it's a faith righteousness. That the promises I have been qualified for, that Jesus is in me and as he is, I must act that way in this world. That I am secure because of the cross. I have the life of God because of his resurrection. Because Jesus is at the right hand of the Father as my intercessor, meaning my lawyer, that as I go forth into this world, he's the one making sure that everything he settled in the new covenant is flowing in your life because you're declaring it, believing it, and saying it. Man, we live so far below what God wants you to do. Father, I pray right now for these amazing folks. I pray for springs. I pray for all of those that are a part of this family of God. I pray that as they listen to this teaching, would you stir them up? Regardless of where they are, what areas they're succeeding, well, Father, I pray that they would sense the tug of your spirit saying, follow me, let me teach you and guide you, and let's make changes. I pray that springs, Father, will rise up as an influence on our cities and our nation and our world in such an amazing way that Father will raise up the leaders of the future that can bring incredible change. And Father, if there are those who are watching right now who don't know you, touch them. I want to lead you in the most powerful prayer I know. It's a prayer of getting right with God, becoming a follower of Christ. If that's your desire, pray this with me. Just say, dear God, thank you for sending Jesus. He died in my place. He paid the full price for me to be forgiven, have a new life, and come into your family. So Jesus, come into my heart. I'm following you the rest of my days. In Jesus' name, amen.